Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us and I hope uh, you find this topic uh, educational and that you also uh, get some valuable information um, as we look at our topic today. Uh, just to begin, uh, my name is David Cash. I'm a member of the marketing team here at Mounts. Uh, and again, thanks for joining us today uh, as we look at uh, the fundamentals of torque control. And so uh, this is going to be uh, primarily a uh, introduction into torque. Uh, we'll look at several different uh, types of uh, topics um, and uh, understand what it uh, is all about uh, as it relates to torque. Uh, so if you are familiar with this uh, topic, you know, it may be a bit remedial, uh, but perhaps you may pick something up uh, that you didn't know um, with the uh, information uh, that we're about to get started with. And so uh, if we take a look at, at basically what the topics that we'll be looking at, uh, we'll look at what is torque, um, we'll look at uh, why torque is used, uh, the torque terminology uh, regarding uh, certain aspects of torque, um, how we measure uh, torque, and then the different types of uh, torque tools that are available uh, to be used to help apply torque. So uh, without any uh, further uh, discussion, let's go ahead and jump into uh, what is torque. And so the classic uh, definition um, of torque is we're measuring a turning or twisting force uh, that is uh, perpendicular or has to the axis of whatever it is uh, that we're turning. And so you may hear uh, torque advertised in uh, automobile engines that it can produce so many foot pounds of torque or uh, even a specification for an electric motor uh, on how much torque it produces. Uh, but in this case, we're dealing with the amount of turning or twisting force as it relates to a fastener and the fastening process. And so uh, oftentimes uh, people think that just by doing uh, the torquing or the turning uh, or the twisting, that that is what uh, is holding our parts together. And uh, torque is really uh, the means to get to our final uh, goal, and that is uh, clamp force. And so uh, clamp force... Um, is a, uh, a measurement of the generated tension uh, that's indirectly controlled by the applied torque to the fastener. So uh, whenever we have uh, components that we want to uh, put together, um, we want to make sure that that clamp force is holding those so there's no movement uh, in that uh, joint. And so this animation uh, will kind of help to uh, explain it uh, possibly a little bit uh, clear. Uh, so if we apply uh, torque to the nut, uh, as we tighten that down or add more torque, the bolt will begin to stretch, uh, providing us our bolt tension. Uh, and this tension is what holds the components together. So we have a force that's pushing up, a force that's pushing down, keeping our components uh, together. And so our uh, goal uh, by having a torque control is by allowing us to create that tension um, over and over and uh, repeat it so that that fastener uh, does not uh, have uh, or has the correct tension to hold the components uh, together. So that's what we're really trying to achieve is uh, clamp force through the use of torque. And so um, it's the torque that we apply that gives us the tension in the fastener, which produces the clamp force. Uh, and that's really uh, what we're, uh, what we're tr really trying to achieve with that. Now, there are other ways to achieve tension, um, but they are not very uh, uh, applicable for the uh, manufacturing process. And so that's why uh, we use torque to help generate um, the tension. So it's really important that uh, we try to be as consistent as possible with um, our uh, components, with our fasteners, um, so we can repeat that uh, tension. Uh, and again, the clamp force uh, is uh, what we are really trying to achieve. Now, um, each fastener 
does have its own um, tensile strength. Um, and basically what that means is uh, a fastener is designed um, and spec to have a certain amount of stretch uh, in it. And so if you think of the fastener as more of like a rubber band where we can pull that rubber band uh, and at some point that rubber band will break, but uh, as long as we don't pull it too far, the rubber band will always go back to uh, its original shape. And so this is the same thing that happens with a, a fastener um, or, or a bolt. It does have um, some type of uh, strength to it that allows it to stretch uh, and then return to its uh, normal uh, resting uh, position. And so if we take a look at this uh, animation here you'll, or this video, you'll see that uh, as the uh, rod gets stretched, eventually it's going to break, but before it does, you see the point at which it starts to deform. Uh, and at that point is uh, basically the uh, yield point, which means that if we stopped uh, pulling at the, uh, at the yield point, uh, the fastener will no longer return back to its original uh, shape. And so if we were to look at this uh, via a graph, um, if we apply load to the fastener, uh, once we get to the yield point, uh, at that point, it now we move from the elastic region of the fastener into a plastic region. Uh, and again, in the plastic region, um, after the yield point is met, that fastener um, is permanently damaged and will no longer return to its uh, normal uh, shape. And so, uh, as long as we are within the elastic region of the fastener, uh, that fastener again will return um, or allow it to stretch uh, and um, will still be uh, viable uh, with its uh, particular use. Um, now you will see um, on fastener specifications uh, that there is a proof load. Uh, this is basically, uh, could be anywhere from 85 to 95% of the yield point. Uh, and then you also have the uh, clamp force load, uh, which is uh, in the ballpark of around 75% um, or so of the proof load. And so when we uh, stretch uh, that fastener, uh, we want to make sure that we're stretching it uh, not past the yield point because if we do, we may end up with a fastener that, uh, that looks like this, um, uh, one that has been um, elongated uh, and it may have some permanent um, deformation uh, in that. And if we do have a fastener that is at this point, uh, any type of vibration, any type of uh, shock uh, can simply uh, cause that fastener to fail uh, because we are so close to that uh, tensile strength um, or the, the tensile load that it can handle. Uh, so we are in a jeopardy of that fastener failing. So uh, controlling the torque uh, and not over torquing a fastener uh, really helps to uh, prevent uh, any type of uh, torque uh, failure. Now under torquing um, is also a problem as well because then vibration uh, can also cause that fastener to loose, loosen uh, and then we would have um, again failure. So we want to make sure that um, the torquing process is done correctly and that we can control that uh, with the uh, correct um, and proper torque. So when we look at um, measuring uh, torque, uh, the Basic uh, classic definition of torque is, is distance times force. Uh, and so if we look at this animation uh, where we are um, applying a torque to a, a fastener, we have um, our basically our lever length uh, times our force. And so in this case, if we have one foot of distance and we're pulling with the uh, force of two pounds, uh, we have two foot pounds of torque. Now, if we increase the lever length to uh, two feet and we pull with the same uh, two pounds of force, we now have uh, four foot pounds of torque. Now, this could be, uh, this would be the same as if we pulled with, uh, say, five uh, pounds of force at two feet. We would now have 10 foot pounds 
of torque. Now, this is uh, for a, a general uh, type of uh, torque formula, uh, but there's uh, ways that we also measure torque uh, via the use of a torque analyzer. And the torque analyzer uh, uses a torque sensor that uh, converts an analog signal to a, a digital signal. Uh, and that's done um, through the use of uh, a electrified circuit, um, which is called a, a string gauge. And so uh, the string gauge um, is a small, uh, almost a postage size stamp uh, um, type of circuit. And as we uh, electrify that circuit, if there's any type of uh, twist or um, any type of uh, deformation of the uh, strain gauge, uh, the resistance within that circuit is going to change. And so this allows us to be able to measure, uh, again, the torque, which is going to be um, an analog uh, to a digital uh, signal. Um, and just to kind of uh, give you an example of what that uh, would look like, so um, on the, uh, the shaft here of um, our sensor, we have a, a string gauge that is laminated onto um, our uh, stock. And as that stock uh, that we use in the uh, analyzer is twisted, uh, we get uh, torsion um, in the uh, component. Uh, and then that torsion uh, is affected the, or is affecting the strain gauge as well. Uh, and the circuit is, uh, again, the resistance is going to change within the circuit. Uh, and that is going to equal uh, the amount of torsion based off of the amount of torque that is being generated. And so this is all uh, basically done um, through, um, again, the use of the strain gauge. And this animation kind of uh, we'll show you a little bit as there is torsion um, applied to um, our sensor. Uh, the uh, strain gauge is going to have different levels of resistance uh, based on how much uh, torsion it may see. Uh, and again, this is all done in the calibration process of the sensor and, and the analyzer. So in this image, you can see we have our, uh, our arm um, that is, then we have uh, dead weights that are hung from that particular arm uh, with a certain uh, torque value uh, that is given. Um, and the analyzer and sensor uh, is then um, uh, correlating the actual resistance within the strain gauge. And it then converts that uh, torsion uh, via the resistance into a torque value that we see. So uh, with um, all of that, that's how we can measure uh, the torque um, electronically. Now, um, we can use different styles of tools within um, our uh, analyzer uh, and our sensor. In this case, we're showing a, a torque screwdriver uh, with our analyzer. Uh, that analyzer is calibrated uh, with our uh, wheels and weights um, and torque arms uh, to a specific value. Uh, that calibration um, is done under an ISO specification. Uh, and so any uh, tool that is uh, validated or calibrated on the torque analyzer is then traceable to the calibration of the uh, actual torque analyzer which is uh, traceable to the actual arms and the weights that are used to do the actual calibration for the torque analyzer. So all of that together, we do have traceability for uh, a particular tool, again, that is tested or is uh, calibrated on that torque analyzer. So with that, uh, that's gonna lead us to um, our poll question for today. Uh, and uh, that question is, um, do you use a torque measurement um, equipment in uh, your facility? 
uh, and it's a quick uh, yes or no uh, type of scenario. So let's go ahead and give you a second to uh, answer those questions. And that will give me a chance to have a drink of water. All right, so uh, with the uh, answers from our poll question, uh, it is about uh, 80% or so that uh, do have a, a torque analyzer um, within uh, the use at, uh, at your facility. Um, if you don't have a, a torque analyzer and you want to have a little bit more control over uh, measuring or analyzing your torque, uh, it's always a, a great idea to have uh, that with you. And we do have several other uh, webinars and presentations regarding the use of uh, torque analyzers for torque verification or for calibration. So let's go ahead and continue on with our presentation. And now we'll talk about um, some of the terminology uh, that's used and that is uh, around the units of measurement of uh, specific uh, torque values. And so the imperial uh, units of measurement um, are in uh, foot pounds, uh, inch pounds, or inch ounces. And so uh, there are 12 uh, inch pounds in one foot pound and there are 16 inch ounces in one inch pound. And so it uh, is very similar to uh, the traditional um, imperial units of measurement that we uh, typically use um, in North America. Um, but uh, you may also uh, hear it as pounds feet or pounds inches. Uh, that, uh, but typically uh, in the industry, it's known as foot pounds, inch pounds, um, or inch ounces. Uh, in the uh, what would be an international standard of uh, units of measurement of torque is. Uh, done in newton meters uh, or newton centimeters or even newton millimeters and so uh, this is uh, basically uh, the uh, unit if we have our our moment arm here with our fulcrum point uh, and that is one meter uh, in distance we are going to put one newton uh, at the end of that meter. And so uh, the Newton um, is equal to about uh, 0 0.2248 pounds, uh, which comes from um, Isaac Newton's um, force uh, measurement. Uh, so that basically is the force needed to accelerate uh, one kilogram of mass uh, at the rate of one meter per second squared. Uh, and so if we convert that uh, meter to inches and we use the weight at 0.2248 uh, that's going to put us at about 8.8 .8 inch pounds uh, per uh, newton meter so if we want to convert uh, that newton meter to uh, inch pounds uh, that's what uh, what we would be looking at again 8.8 .8 .8 inch pounds uh, for one uh, newton meter. Now, you may think that, uh, or sometimes um, it can be confused that uh, the newton meter is a metric uh, scale, uh, but uh, it's only half metric uh, because we are using a meter, but uh, the other half there is the newton, uh, which is not uh, a, a metric unit. But uh, for the uh, metric standard of units of measurement, we use a gram force meters or kilogram force meters or uh, kilogram force uh, centimeters. And so uh, again, this is the same uh, type of uh, scenario where we have a meter worth uh, or a centimeter uh, moment arm, and then we would have a kilogram or a gram uh, on the end of that arm, which is going to give us our unit of measurement. And so those are primarily the units of measurement that uh, you will typically see. Uh, if you need the uh, need help in converting any type of uh, unit of measurement, you can go to our website 
And there we have a conversion calculator uh, that makes it very easy. You enter in the unit of measurement that you have, uh, and then you can simply hit convert, and that will go ahead and convert uh, that unit um, into uh, an additional uh, unit of measurement for um, all of those uh, particular units that we just talked about. So it makes it very easy uh, to be able to uh, do that within uh, the website for uh, the unit of measurement conversion. Now, uh, we'll look at uh, basically the different styles of torque tools uh, that are uh, typically used in uh, the assembly process. Uh, and so uh, the first one is going to be uh, torque uh, screwdrivers. Now, torque screwdrivers uh, work primarily like uh, any other screwdriver, uh, except for uh, when they meet reach a certain uh, torque value, that torque screwdriver is going to slip uh, in our case, it's going to cam over uh, and then it will be uh, available to be used again, um, but it will always run up to a certain level of torque uh, and then it will cam over or slip. And so with that, um, most uh, torque screwdrivers are a preset type of uh, tool. So there is a, uh, a spring that is inside of the body of the tool. That spring um, is compressed to a certain point, uh, and that is how we can uh, set the torque value. I'll show you an animation on that here in just a second, but uh, these, these types of tools can go from a very low uh, inch ounce um, torque value, so uh, three inch ounces, all the way up to around 120 inch pounds. Uh, then there's different models uh, in between there. Uh, and this type of tool um, is also available in an adjustable style of, uh, of tool where you can set the torque value that, uh, that you may need. Um, but primarily, uh, a lot of the torque screwdrivers uh, are a preset type of tool. And so um, with the uh, spring compression um, is basically how we control uh, the torque value. And so in our uh, tools, we use a, um, a radial cam design. Uh, and so within the uh, drive mechanism, as the screwdriver is turned, uh, we have ball bearings that uh, push. There's a series of three. Those ball bearings push on a larger ball bearing, which compresses our spring. Uh, this gives us a really smooth, uh, a really consistent uh, type of compression um, of our spring. And that is basically the, uh, the difference between different styles of torque screwdrivers uh, that you may see on the market. Uh, and so how that spring is compressed is really the difference in uh, the quality and the output that you would receive with a torque screwdriver. Next is going to be uh, torque wrenches. And now there are a number of different styles of, of torque wrenches as well. Uh, and most of them do use the same type of spring compression to uh, monitor or generate a specific torque. Um, the first wrench here uh, that we see on the uh, left side is going to be a cam over style of wrench. Uh, this is very similar to the screwdriver we just looked at. Um, you can pull on that wrench. Um, it's going to go to a certain torque value and then it's going to slip. So you can never over torque anything with this uh, type of torque wrench. Uh, next, we have a, a breakover style of torque wrench. Uh, this is going to allow the head to, comp to break over once it reaches a certain torque value. Again, to, to try to help us from preventing any type of over torque to a, uh, a fastener. We also have uh, a click wrench, um, which is by far the most uh, used wrench in the world. Um, the click wrench will signal once you've reached a certain uh, torque by a clicking sound and uh, an auto or an audible and a sensory feel within the unit. So uh, in this case, we have a spring that is uh, compressing and there is a little uh, what's called a jump block inside. Once that uh, spring pressure gets to a certain point, that block will uh, click over uh, and hit the inside of the uh, tube of the wrench. Uh, and that's where you get 
uh, the term click wrench. Um, and so uh, the click wrench will signal when the torque is achieved. However, um, if the operator continues to pull on that wrench or sometimes will double click it or triple click it, you can add a tremendous amount of over torque to that particular uh, fastener. So uh, as the click wrench is the most popular type of tool, um, it's also the most um, operator uh, dependent style of tool, meaning the operator really needs to be careful uh, when they're using this, this tool or we can add additional torque to the fastener uh, that's definitely not wanted. Uh, and then last, there are um, electronic type of torque wrenches. Uh, that may use a uh, again a strain gauge type of uh, sensor um, as the wrench is pulled it's going to give us the torque value uh, again but this is uh, much like the click wrench where it's just going to signal when you've hit your torque value uh, it's not going to prevent any type of over torque uh, that you would see with either the cam over style tool or the breakover style tool Next is going to be um, electric uh, torque wrenches or torque screwdrivers. Uh, and these are power tools that are uh, preset to a certain um, torque value. These are again controlled by a, a spring. And there are several different types of options that are available with the uh, electric style tools. Um, you can have adjustable RPM tools. You can have tools that have a soft start feature to them uh, or tools that may have a soft stop feature to them because the material that you're using is a delicate um, material. You don't want to damage that. Uh, we have uh, electric screwdrivers that will, um, will actually uh, torque twice uh, because we may have a gasket uh, that we're trying to compress. So there are a lot of different styles of electronic uh, power uh, screwdrivers. And, and again, these are controlled by a, uh, a spring mechanism that once that spring gets compressed, the clutch is tripped, uh, tripped and then the tool will shut off. And if we take a look at uh, what the spring mechanism uh, looks like within the tool. So in the uh, nose cone portion of the tool, there is that spring. Uh, and as we can turn that uh, cone, uh, we can move it up or move it down. And you can see there are some reference marks on the, on the tool. Uh, that reference mark is going to provide us a certain torque value with that collar locked at that uh, specific point. Um, it's not a torque value that's on the actual tool, but it's a reference point. Uh, and then the tool is set up on a torque analyzer to make sure that it's repeating at the torque that uh, is called for for that particular uh, tool. Uh, these tools can uh, be in the low, uh, again, inch ounce range, um, all the way up to um, about 80 inch pounds or so, but primarily you'll see these uh, in the uh, range from one to about uh, 25, 30 inch pounds or so. Uh, but these are a popular style of tool uh, to be used as well. Uh, the next uh, style of uh, torque tool uh, that's used um, is going to be the DC control tool. Now this is the uh, the tool that's going to give us the greatest uh, flexibility in being able to uh, not only uh, be able to control everything that happens from the moment that the trigger is pulled until the fastener is finally seated. Uh, we have great flexibility in there because of the uh, electronics and the control that is built into this style of tool. Uh, one tool can have multiple different presets. Uh, we can also collect data from the fastening process. So this type of tool is uh, really um, um, great in those uh, areas where you need to have documentation of a particular uh, assembly that may have been or that may needs to be, be done. Uh, we can also create assembly uh, programs around a particular um, product that may have multiple different uh, presets to be used at different torque values and we can program all of that into the, uh, the tool. These are controlled um, either by uh, current 
or by a sensor, um, which is very much like the sensor that we uh, looked at for the uh, torque analyzer. Uh, but that type of uh, system really gives us uh, a lot of uh, really good control um, in the uh, a process of repeatability and accuracy. Uh, this type of tool is by far the most accurate tool uh, that you will see. Um, if we look at the uh, previous electric tools, um, those are going to be in the ballpark of about three or excuse me about five percent or so plus or minus for the repeatability uh, for this style of tool we're looking at uh, around three to five percent um, for the hand tools they could be either four percent or six percent depending on the torque range um, but again the dc tool gives us the greatest flexibility uh, as it relates to the the fastening process uh, and next was going to be the uh, use of uh, pneumatic style of tools. Um, these can be done um, again either by a, a spring um, or we have a higher torque values that can be achieved uh, with the use of an air tool through uh, what is known as a pulse tool. Uh, a pulse tool uses a hydraulic uh, clutch mechanism that does allow it to uh, be used at much higher torque values with any without any type of torque reaction uh, that may happen when that tool shuts off. Uh, that's a really a good advantage of this tool. Um, the downside of this type of tool is that uh, the uh, repeatability of that is going to be in the range of about plus or minus 15%. Um, and a standard pneumatic uh, clutch tool is going to be in that ballpark from 10 to 15%. Uh, but the advantage of the air tool is that it can go to a much higher torque value than uh, an electric tool uh, can. So and then finally, uh, we'll look at uh, the torque multiplier. Um, this is for the use of uh, much, much higher torque values. So we could be in the uh, tens of thousands of foot pounds. Uh, and this type of tool um, can either be a uh, run by a pneumatic stall motor uh, or the examples that you see here um, are an electronic version where it's monitoring the amount of current that uh, runs through the tool. When that current gets to a certain level, um, then the tool will uh, shut off. Uh, so we uh, develop a correlation between the amount of current, the uh, gear uh, package that is within the multiplier. So it could be uh, four to one, eight to one, 16 to one, 32 to one. Uh, it just depends on uh, the uh, gear uh, setup that we have. Um, and the uh, reaction foot that you see here is going to be, um, excuse me one second. Uh, the reaction uh, foot that you see here is uh, going to help generate the torque that is uh, needed uh, on there. And so here's an example of a uh, hand multiplier uh, being used. Um, you can see that the input is just a standard uh, torque wrench. Uh, and that could be uh, maybe a 200 to 300 foot pound torque wrench. Uh, but the amount of torque that's being uh, generated could be a in, the, in a four to one uh, type of scenario. So at 200 foot pounds, we're now producing 800 foot pounds of torque uh, through the final output. And the reaction uh, foot there you see is uh, right up against the uh, adjacent faster uh, and that is what helps generate uh, the torque value uh, that's being applied to the fastener Whew. so to bring all of that back to uh, what we started with um, all of those tools are designed to provide us with a certain torque to give us a certain tension that we need within that particular fastener uh, to, pro to provide us with the clamp force that we need to keep the uh, components together. So if there's nothing else that, uh, that you get out of this presentation, um, I hope it is this, uh, this concept of the torque that we're using is generating the tension to help keep our components together through the use of clamp force. And so with that, um, let's go ahead and move to any uh, questions uh, that we might have.
and we can uh, look at that. Uh, so, uh, Chris, do we have any questions? Hey, Dave. Yeah, the uh, first question we have is, does the hand position influence uh, that torque output on a wrench? So uh, that is a, a great question, um, and uh, it certainly does. On the uh, click style wrench um, or a, a breakover style of wrench, um, if we change that uh, the hand position, we are now changing the uh, fulcrum point uh, for that actual uh, uh, wrench. Um, if we uh, move our hand closer to the uh, the drive mechanism. Uh, we're going to be increasing the torque. If we move it away, then we're going to be decreasing. Um, and that's because the, the fulcrum point in the click wrench um, or the breakover wrench is, is basically inside of the tool, meaning it's not at the very end of the tool. So we're going to uh, change the amount of torque. Now, if we use a cam over style wrench, the uh, placement of where you hold it um, is no longer uh, dependent. So uh, the cam over style of torque wrench is basically a non length dependent tool, meaning you can hold it anywhere you would like. We're still going to generate the torque output um, at the end of the tool uh, because our, our fulcrum point is at the end of the tool um, and not inside of the tool. So I hope that makes sense. All right, Dave, thanks. Uh, the next question we have is, how does an extension affect the torque output? So again, that is uh, basically what we're doing is we are moving the fulcrum point uh, further away from the end of the tool. Uh, so we need to make sure that we calculate for that. Um, if we do add a crow's foot or some type of extension to the end of the drive. Um, so we can calculate that. Um, it's just uh, something that needs to be considered when you do add uh, that type of extension to the end of a torque tool. All right. My next question, Dave, is, is there a difference between like an accuracy and repeatability of a tool? So, yeah. So the, um, the way that uh, the accuracy and repeatability work, um, you can have a, a, a tool um, that uh, may be very repeatable, um, meaning that it is always around uh, one specific value. However, the target that you needed um, was uh, is not being met. Um, that is the accuracy component um, of that. So uh, that tool may need to be adjusted uh, to make sure that it is repeatable around its accuracy point. So those are basically uh, two uh, different uh, types of uh, measurement. So we want to make sure that um, the accuracy um, is the values that are close to the target. Uh, the repeatability is how uh, wide the spread of the um, actual values are. Uh, that would be considered its repeatability. Uh, great. The next question we have, Dave, is what's the easiest method to measure running torque on a fastener? So if you want to measure uh, running torque, uh, you could use a different type of torque sensor. Um, we didn't really talk about it in this presentation, um, but it would be the use of a, a rotary torque sensor. Uh, this type of sensor allows you to put uh, your tool, uh, the sensor, and then your part and it will measure uh, basically dynamically as you're using your tool, uh, what that torque value is. Um, so if you go to our uh, website, um, you can look at our rotary sensors um, and that type of uh, sensor will give us the ability to uh, measure um, the fasteners uh, while it's being used um, or if there's any type of prevailing torque as well. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, is there any type of fastener guide to help you know select optimum torque for a fastener, given the size of the fastener and the materials that you can reference? Yeah, so uh, typical, uh, typically, um, fastener companies um, produce uh, the uh, specs for their fasteners. Um, they give you what the uh, proof load 
uh, is going to be for that fastener that's typically measured in a, a PSI uh, type of um, value. Um, there are some other uh, factors that you can use, um, such as a, a K factor um, or K nut factor that help you to develop a torque specification. Um, but if you are having any issues with uh, trying to figure out a torque specification, uh, we could go back to that slide that we used uh, for the yield point. And you can do some destructive tests uh, with a torque analyzer to see at which point your fastener may be failing. Uh, and then you can uh, reduce that, that amount to about 75% um, of that value of your your uh, your failure point um, and that should give you a good um, a good representation of what your torque value should be uh, but there are specifications that manufacturers of fasteners provide uh, to help with the um, actual uh, specifications of the fasteners uh, but it's always good to do testing um, and you'll see that within their literature as well that a lot of the information that they're providing is um, simply uh, theoretical uh, and you may need to do testing um, on your components to make sure that uh, you're getting what you need. All right, thanks Dave. Um, next question is what variables can influence torque? So there are a, a number of different variables that can um, influence the torque. Um, first is going to be the um, actual tool that's being used. Um, again, if it's a, if a click style wrench or uh, a tool that's very um, heavily influenced by the operator, uh, that can be a, a variable. Uh, we look at um, the fastener itself, um, the coefficient of friction. Um, that could be a, a variable. Um, if that changes, uh, there could be a change in the uh, amount of uh, uh, clamp load um, because of the amount of torque that's generated because of the change of the coefficient of friction. Um, and uh, one of the biggest ones uh, could be a, uh, a component um, actual material change. So you may have uh, materials that uh, um, are different from what is spec, and so that can be a, a certain variable. And then the largest one is going to be uh, the operator themselves. Um, they do, uh, again, uh, have a lot of influence over the output uh, that happens during the assembly process. Um, are they completing the rundown? Is there uh, missing components, uh, missing washers? Uh, all of those types of uh, factors um, from the operator themselves can certainly play uh, a huge uh, part in the amount of uh, variation that may be seen within the torque output. All right, thanks, Dave. And it looks like it's the last of our, wait, I have another one. Does nylon locking nuts affect the torque? Uh, yes, um, it, it certainly does affect the, uh, the torque. Uh, because now we're adding um, additional resistance um, when the fastener is being um, tightened. So um, if there was uh, not uh, any nylon um, within that fastener, it would certainly spin a, a lot easier, uh, meaning that once we hit our certain torque value, the uh, fastener would be stretched to a certain point. Um, if we increase the amount of prevailing torque by the use of the, the nylon uh, locking uh, threads, then uh, some of that torque that uh, we used is being used to overcome uh, that friction. Uh, and so we're not going to get the same stretch that we would if that uh, nylon uh, lock uh, isn't there. So that is a consideration that uh, should be uh, accounted for. Um, and uh, at least tested for uh, as well to make sure that you're getting the correct clamp force uh, from the torque that's being applied. All right, Dave. That looks like that's the last of our questions. All right. 
Thank you uh, very much for uh, joining us uh, today. Uh, I hope you found, uh, again, the information um, useful. And I know it was, uh, again, uh, the uh, kind of a, a basic type of overview. Uh, and there was a lot of information. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out uh, to us. Um, and we can certainly help to try to answer any questions that you might have regarding your assembly process, uh, your tools, or how you measure or apply torque. So uh, thanks again, and we will see you next time.